All right, thanks very much. And thank you for inviting me to be uh, part of this uh, really interesting meeting here. Um, as Ken mentioned, my, my group at the University of Pennsylvania studies how environmental factors influence our susceptibility for many of the common diseases that we talked about this morning, uh, including metabolic diseases like, like obesity and, and diabetes, um, but also general inflammatory diseases. And, and uh, uh, we heard an interesting, a very interesting case about neurodegenerative uh, diseases earlier today. Um, but what I want to do today is to draw your attention to one of the studies that were, was for us the, the, the entry point to what I'm going to show you, which is what you can see here. This is a, a study that was published uh, a couple of years ago uh, by a group in Denmark, um, which was basically done on, on uh, tens of thousands of people in Denmark and arriving at the conclusion that uh, high BMI uh, is associated with a higher risk for, uh, for infection. Um, for us, this was, this was maybe no surprise initially because there was a lot of evidence in the literature, some of it we discussed this morning already that uh, was pointing to this. But for us as basic scientists, what was really interesting is that there is hardly any scientific um, mechanistic data that can explain this, uh, this connection, and this is what, what was drawing our attention to this. Um, there's just one more point that I want to make about this paper before I move on, which is that, that they, they went into great detail in this study of, of uh, subdividing um, the, the infections that they studied into different organ systems, different uh, infectious agents, um, and they basically arrived at the conclusion that this holds true across the board, across many different tissues, respiratory infections, uh, skin infections, many types of mucosal infections, and for the purpose of this talk, um, most interestingly to me, also gastrointestinal infections. Um, and as I said, we had very little mechanistic knowledge, so what we usually do when we're lacking mechanistic knowledge is we turn to mice. Um, so we used uh, this, this system specifically, um, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this system. Here we're looking at a, a mouse that is called the DBDB mouse, which, is, uh, which has a mutation in the leptin receptor, um, which, which basically um, uh, prevents this, uh, this mouse from feeling satiety, and it never stops eating. So it, it's fed a normal diet, but it, it basically becomes morbidly obese, and this is a, um, a, a brother of this mouse that uh, is, is a wild type control. And as we expected, um, when we look at this mouse, this uh, obese mouse here in molecular detail, we can see that they, are, they have what we call a, a leaky gut phenomenon, which means that here we're looking uh, in, the, in the serum, the spleen, and the livers of these mice, and our readout is uh, microbial molecules that trigger some of these uh, uh, receptors of the innate immune system, like the TLRs and NLRs are basically these receptors for, for molecules coming from bacteria. And you can see that regardless of where we look, the signal is always much higher in the DBDB mouse, which is indicative of the fact that there is translocation of microbial molecules um, across the gut barrier in these mice, and that's why we can detect these molecules at systemic sites. Now we can go even further and we can look in more detail at the, at the intestinal barrier. Um, here we're doing it by RNA sequencing, and here we're quantifying the expression of uh, ZO1, which is one of the main proteins involved in, in making a tight barrier in the gastrointestinal tract, and you can see that this DBDB mouse is not only morbidly obese, but has a very uh, poor barrier function in the GI tract. Now, what is the consequence of this? And this brings me to the, to the main topic of this talk, which is enteric infection. So what we do here is we're infecting these mice with a bioluminescent version of a mouse pathogen called Citrobacter rodentium, which is, which, which is the mouse equivalent of pathogenic E. coli in humans. And you can see here, just by, by looking at this by eye, that these mice are massively colonized. And here, over time, we can track the luminescence, and, and we can see that there is massive outgrowth of these bacteria in the, in the, in the morbidly obese uh, host. And as a consequence of this, there is not only more growth of the bacteria, but they, just like the microbial molecules that we've looked at uh, before, they, they translocate to the systemic uh, circulation and to systemic tissues, like the mesenteric lymph node, the spleen, and the liver, and we can see these mice to be massively colonized. Um, which never occurs in, in a wild-type mouse because this is a self-limiting infection that stays in the GI tract unless there is a barrier problem, and if there is a barrier problem, then, then this kind of uh, phenotype happens. So at this stage, we thought, okay, the, probably the story is very easy. There is a leaky gut uh, affected with, uh, with morbid obesity. Um, so we thought we'll just do one more experiment to prove this, um, which is a, um, a paired feeding experiment. So what we do here is, again, we take wild-type mice and DBDB mice, um, but instead of DVDB mice ad libitum fed, as we had before, that are becoming obese over time, we do uh, what we call pair feeding. So we just we limit the amount that the DVDB mouse can eat to what, uh, what the wild type litter mates had eaten. Um, and we basically prevent obesity this way. So now we have this red group 
which is still a, a leptin receptor deficient mouse, but it's not obese because you can see here that we just limit the food intake to keep this mouse lean. And now to our surprise, these mice, even though they were lean, they were still susceptible to the infection. You can see here that the bacteria still grow as much as in the fat uh, control mice, and there is as much mortality. And this was a big surprise to us because we thought it's just uh, the association of obesity to enteric infection, but it seems like this is not the case. Um, so what, what ended up being the case is that it's actually not obesity per se that is causing this, this uh, phenotype, but it's hyperglycemia. Because in addition to um, these mice being, being morbidly obese, they're also hyperglycemic, as we would expect them from being uh, type 2 diabetic. So we thought maybe hyperglycemia by itself is driving this phenotype. So we used a different model, which is a, a type 1 diabetes model, um, which is, which is uh, basically generating hyperglycemia, as you can see here, by injecting a toxin uh, called streptozotocin, which is killing um, pancreatic beta cells that are insulin producing. So now we have no longer insulin in the mouse, um, and they become very hyperglycemic. And interestingly for us, they also become very susceptible to the same infection. Again, here you can see this uh, luminescent signal over time. So even though this mouse is not obese at all, it's exactly the same weight as the controls, but it's hyperglycemic, and this uh, renders them susceptible to, to this uh, severe infection. And just like you've seen before for the DBDB mouse, these uh, streptozotocin-treated mice, they now have systemic colonization uh, by the bacteria in the spleen and the liver, and they also have these uh, massive intestinal barrier problems. So now we see that uh, they, they have uh, abrogated levels of ecaterin in this case, which is another component that makes the barrier very stable. Um, and you can see, just like I've shown you before, in this uh, microbial translocation assay, we now see in these uh, streptozotocin treated mice, in the liver and the serum, we see very high levels of microbial molecules um, that we can detect in these systemic places. The last uh, piece of data I want to show you is, uh, is our insight into the, into the mechanism of how this works. Because usually when we talk about glucose entering uh, into the body, it comes through a co-transporter with sodium, and then along a passive uh, concentration gradient, goes into the bloodstream uh, by exiting the intestinal epithelial cells. And this passive transport is called GLU2, glucose transporter 2. So what we hypothesize is that in a case of uh, metabolic disease, where the mouse is hyperglycemic and has very high concentrations of glucose here in the blood, maybe we, we basically turn around this concentration gradient and instead of leaving the intestinal epithelial cells, glucose is now uh, accumulating in the intestinal epithelial cells, causing damage to the barrier. So to test whether this is true, we generated a mouse that is lacking this uh, glucose transporter and basically doesn't have any glucose flux into intestinal epithelial cells. And as you can see here, indeed, we can prevent the problems associated with uh, barrier dysfunction. Um, so here, these are these mice that are lacking um, GLU2 only intestinal epithelial cells. And when we treat them with streptozotocin too, we render them hyperglycemic, but we can at least partially prevent these barrier problems from happening. As you can see here by, uh, again, ZO1 quantification ecoterin. And again, here, when we look at our microbial molecule assay, we no longer have this uh, accumulation as we have in the control mice here. And as, along the same lines, these mice are also protected from, uh, from having this uh, systemic spread of, of uh, bacteria after enteric infection. Here you can see the control case, case which you already know is uh, massively colonized systemically. Um, but when we eliminate GLU2 from intestinal epithelial cells, then we have a reduction in bacterial counts system at systemic sites like the spleen and the liver. So with this, I'd like to summarize uh, what I showed you and add a few more details here that I didn't have time to talk about, um, which is that in the case of a diabetic individual, we have glucose entering intestinal epithelial cells, basically following a retrograde flow into intestinal epithelial cells. Um, causing glucose metabolism in the cell and transcriptional and epigenetic reprogramming that I didn't have time to show you, which leads ultimately to alteration of barrier function, which is usually protecting from uh, protecting uh, or preventing microbial molecules from entering the systemic circulation. But if we have this reprogramming of intestinal epithelial cells by glucose, uh, then we have abrogated barrier function and translocation of, of bacteria and their molecules to the, to the systemic circulation. Now here I'm showing you uh, um, uh, diabetic and healthy people in the background, even though everything I've shown you so far was done in mice. So the last piece of data I want to show you is our first exploration um, to see whether the same mechanism is true in humans. And what we did is uh, we started with a small cohort of, of uh, healthy individuals that volunteered to, uh, to let us uh, examine the level of microbial molecules in their blood 
Um, and it's, at the same time, they gave us a, um, a blood sample, which we used to analyze many different blood parameters. And here are the results. So here we did exactly the same assays I've shown you before for mice. And we're basically looking at uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the abundance of microbial molecules in their blood. So here you can see the average cor correlation of the signal uh, from many different parameters that we assessed in their blood with the microbial molecule abundance in their systemic circulation. And what was really striking to us was that the number one hit up here is uh, hemoglobin A1C, which is uh, glycated hemoglobin, which is an indicator for long-term glycemic control. So you can see that having high HbA1c highly, highly correlates with having uh, uh, high abundance of microbial molecules, which is indicative of a leaky barrier in the, in the gut. While, for example, BMI um, wasn't correlated at all. It's somewhere here. It's right here, BMI. And you can see some of them plotted here. So for example, uh, TLR ligands, which is basically a lipopolysaccharide from, from gram-negative bacteria, correlates with uh, HbA1c. Um, while, while uh, these, the same molecules don't correlate at all with BMI, which means that we can conclude from this that it's actually, just like in the case of the mice, it's not, it's not uh, obesity per se or metabolic disease per se, but it's specifically hyperglycemia, which seems to be causing this phenotype. And I think uh, as we're expanding this uh, human analysis, this will have important uh, um, consequences for how we consider uh, the importance of glycemic control and how we can might be using this uh, information for uh, prevention of enteric infection in these individuals. So uh, with this, I'll stop here. Um, just to thank many of the individuals that were involved in this work, um, as well as the funding agencies that are supporting us. Thanks very much.